Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode of The Failure Effect. This week, we're with a very special guest, a fellow podcaster called uh, Amani Maranga. Now, you know him as the host of an award-winning podcast called Living Truthfully, which is conversations between men about mental health, you know, and wellness. And he is also a culture whisperer. I think he's going to have to explain what that means to us. He is a certified mediator. He's a speaker. He's an MC, and he's a father of two children. Have I missed anything out? No, just uh, apart from my looks, um, <laughs> you, you did just well. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good whatever time it is, wherever you are. Welcome to Living Truthfully, the podcast. Uh, she uh, thinks uh, this alone. is what no, no, no. that's going to be CG don't failure hijack. effect, <laughs> CG Nini. So why are you? How are you? Welcome to Living Truthfully. <laughs> Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. My you would be the first female guest at Living Truthfully oh, really? if this happened. Okay. All right. That's okay. excellent. But, but I'll, let, I'll let you have your shine. So let's do yours. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. So let's start by explaining what exactly does a culture whisperer do? Whisper, <laughs> culture, all the time. I'm joking. Um, so I help organizations uh, think through mm -hmm. uh, and their culture mm -hmm. and inculcate the desired uh, corporate culture. Okay. Um, uh, let me. We make three statements when we are pitching for corporate culture work. So the yeah. first one is by a guy called Peter Draka, mm -hmm. uh, who says culture is strategy for breakfast. Right which means that you can have a great strategy as a business. You, you can have great plans, even great revenue for a while. But if your culture is not right, eventually your culture will um, eat your strategy for breakfast. Uh, we've seen that with some of the businesses uh, locally that, and even internationally that have not survived when they could have. You know, We have mm -hmm. retail stores that have shut down. Uh, that were local, that were big, that were, you know, but they, they had culture issues. We've seen banks close down that were culture issues, regardless of the fact that they were making um, revenue. So culture eats strategy for breakfast. Okay. Second one, and that's a, that's a main cause. The so second one is that, you know, um, there's no vacuum in culture. So if you do not intentionally create one, then a culture will emerge because people have to work and find a way of working with each other chances are that imagined culture will have some good things, yeah. but also that imagined culture will have some bad things, you know? And so the third thing then follows is that culture equals values. And so what, we, what that means is that we hope that we can help businesses align their values with how it, they're lived by their people. So if you say, say your value is integrity, then every time I interact with people that work in your business uh, or in your company, then I see they're people of integrity. It's a double-edged sword, though, mm -hmm. because culture equals values also means that what the business really values is where the culture will follow. And so you might say that you value integrity, but then what you really value is revenue. And so what happens is that then people will go after revenue even at the expense of integrity. Mm -hmm. And if you keep doing that, then the first thing will happen again. Mm -hmm. Where culture will eat strategy for breakfast. And so right. we help businesses align their culture, their values, their behaviors, their beliefs uh, to where they should be as an organization. That's what a culture whisperer does. Wow. I mean, that's fascinating because that sort of work takes, I suppose, years of experience working for different businesses. So it you does. understand culture from very many different perspectives. So by the time you're training organizations, you have a range, a scope of knowledge that is unrivaled. It, it, it does. It's, it's both knowledge, it's experience. We started this work by helping organizations with their internal communications and I ran an agency called 360. And part of it was to, uh, it, we just wanted to help organizations speak within the organization. And we, we, reali we realized we're doing culture work. However, you get part of it is experience from working in toxic environments. And you're like, why does a work environment have to be so toxic, so hard, so bad? Um, and then, but, but I think today it's not even so much about that experience, that knowledge. Um, it's about my desire for people to live fulfilled lives mm -hmm. at home and at work. Mm -hmm. And so if I can help people have fulfilled lives in their work environment by ensuring that they have a work environment that is rewarding, is rewarding for the things that they value and for values. And you can, you can literally show up 
as yourself at work, the way you show up as yourself at home. Then you can live a more fulfilled life. And for me, that's, that I feel is my mission, is my purpose in life is to help people uh, live authentic lives. So you don't have to have a work life and a home life. And, you know, you don't have to wear three, four different masks. Mm -hmm. You can be the same person and bring your brilliance into every aspect of your life. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. So when you talk about living authentically, I am... Um, it's, it, it behoves me to ask where all of this came from because it must have started from somewhere, right? So tell us a little bit about where you grew up, how you grew up, what your school life was like. It started in 1930. Oh, sorry? When Uruguay won the first World Cup. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, cup rhymes with up. Okay, I'm joking. Um, I, I grew up, I'm a shag's kid. Yeah. Um, I grew up in, my earliest memories are in Molo, then Narok, mm -hmm. then Nakuru, mm -hmm. and then eventually came to Nairobi in my teens as I was doing my high school in a wonderful um, national school, better than, you know, these people you hear talking about, gee, they had English names before, <laughs> uh, now their name is just like a patch, you know, something <laughs> like that, you know. I was in the Moi Forces Academy. <laughs> right. um, and, and then I, I got the opportunity to go to Daystar mm -hmm. uh, University. And um, I, was, I was in Daystar at the river uh, for a couple of years. And then we ran out of money. Um, we, we literally had to do a fundraiser for me to go to school. Um, and in my second year, we didn't have enough cash. I was struggling to get onto the bus to go to school every day because I was a day bug. And at some point, I was like, you know what, take control of your life. So I told my folks, okay, I'll take it on from here on and started working. And um, I've been hustling in this Nairobi ever since. Right. But then you do have a range of knowledge that is way beyond, you know, yes. what you would learn. So, so like, let me start with school. And, and, you know, I can see how the world is changing today. Daystar was the first place I got a chance to MC, mm -hmm. like something serious in my fresher year. And that really gave me a lot of confidence. Now I'd been on stage before, I'd been on stage in church, I had, you know, you know, I'd been in high school, you know, drama, music, but somehow this felt significant, it felt important when I was in school and it was, I think, our fresher dinner or one of those, uh, events that you, you, you do in, in campus in your first semester. And I was asked to MC and I was told I did a really good job. And I built a career then doing that. Mm -hmm. When I was looking for a university to go to um, and I was looking for courses to do, I wanted to do music. Music has always been my first love. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in those days, there was no successful <laughs> local musician. So you know, music was not a career, mm -hmm. not, not like it is today. So my parents wouldn't let me study music. But I then took the next best thing, which was communication. Uh, hopefully that one day I'd become a TV presenter because, you know, mm -hmm. um, that's what I thought, communication and media. And I did a minor in music. I went to uni and figured that I loved communication. I didn't know it. And I'm so glad I gave it a chance. Yeah. Uh, I loved communication. I loved everything about it. We had a, a public speaking class module that for me was life-changing. Um, so uni was amazing, mm -hmm. uh, even for the short time that I was there. Um, and so, yeah, I started learning myself and learning skills and things. And then I got into the workplace. And um, as I started working, you know, one job teaches you the next. So... One of my very first jobs was supposed to be a, I was supposed to be a PRO, public relations officer for this small uh, NGO, a Christian based NGO that did mentorship for students. Well, for students. And we, we, we did leadership training for prefects. It was called Emerging Young Leaders. I'd engaged with them a few, uh, like a couple of years before and now I got to work for them. But what I ended up being was just the admin in the office. Mm -hmm. And which meant I made tea, I cleaned, I 
did petty cash. I learned how to use Excel sheets. I hated doing petty cash. Hated <laughs> it. Hated. Hated reconciling. Like you get the only numbers I want to have in my in my life is just bank balance. Mm-hmm. Hi. You know that's it. I hear you. Yeah, th- that's it. Um, so, but learning how to do the spreadsheets, doing banking reconciliation, it was so tedious and hard at the time. It felt, mm-hmm. but so useful for me when I later became an entrepreneur right. and I needed to look at my own accounts mm-hmm. and understand what this accountant was writing for me and look at the reconciliations that they'd done. Mm-hmm. So yes, I you know in my in my early career days I did that. I then worked for an entrepreneur who was uh, rolling out Simu Jami. Mm-hmm. I was one of the first dealers for Simu Jami. It was such an interesting thing. There was no, you know, we went to city council and told them we wanted to put phones on bicycles that people could make mobile phone calls. Those they couldn't fathom. There was no category for it in their tariffs. Yeah. So we were trying to explain it's like a mobile, it's like a booth because at that time there was this booth for mobile phones that Kensel used to have. Yes. So it was like it's like a booth, but it's actually mobile. It mm-hmm. can, you know, <laughs> it, it it didn't make sense. Uh huh. And such wonderful pioneering days. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I learned that I had a flair for business. You know, uh, we were selling phones as well and just trying to figure out how to make sure that the market prices are right for us. You know, you'd we were one of the at the time the we would bring in a lot of phones, and sometimes you'd run like an ad. You know, um, Nokia thirty three ten, five thousand one hundred, which was the wholesale price, uh-huh. or four thousand nine hundred, which was just below the wholesale price. Mm-hmm. Then you get calls, calls from all these people, especially those warriors. Hey, waria, you simu, and then you're like, okay, I then, but they haven't arrived. Yeah. So you say they're finished, they're finished, they're finished. Demand is high like this. They arrive the next day, say, uh, Nokia 3310 uh, price, 5,300. Because you've created a deficit in the market, a perceived deficit, the next day, everyone is willing to pay that 200 shillings more than, and you're selling bulk, so you make some money. I mean, it was, I learned I had a flair for business. It was interesting. Um, you know, you actually should be mentoring on 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 how to use these tactics in business as opposed to culture, <laughs> because you're really good at it. I was good at it then. Okay. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I think there's, and and I, I do mentor sometimes uh, some young people, some young entrepreneurs. Some of those tactics wouldn't play the same as mm-hmm. today. We didn't have social media then. Yeah. Uh, today, everyone can open an online store. They, they can dictate price, which is different from at that time. It was a, you literally had to do a classified ad in a newspaper. You know, there was nowhere else. Mm-hmm. So after the classified ad of massages, then yours would be there for phones. <laughs> so it was. It's true. It's it, it, okay. they're good times. They're good times. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So um, we're gonna go to 2007 because that's when we first met. And at the time, you were a manager for a club. It was actually 2006. Okay. So I was a um, young, ambitious. Um, I was I had all the energy in the world. And at that time, I felt my, my, my world was sort of coming together. Um, it was coming very well together because even though I'd had some... You know, at the back end of that, there were some really tough days. You know, I'd been fired from a job <laughs> uh, before that. I had what, uh, what happened? I was told I was no longer strategic. What? Okay, yeah. I- explain. No, no, no. I just had a dream job. Uh huh. Which was? I don't know if I can say it. So I I used to manage entertainment mm-hmm. for one of the big malls in Nairobi, mm-hmm. recreation and entertainment. And I thought we were doing well, and you know I had great relationships at work. And then at the beginning of 2005, after the December holidays, and you know we, we take a break because that's our business season. Take a break, and then I go back to work, and I'm fired. I'm told you're no longer strategic. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I, I've been trying to be strategic ever since. Right. <laughs> I'm joking. I, I see. <laughs> but. but yeah, so I'd, I'd had, you know, like a relationship that had ended and 
2005 was 2000 yeah 2005 was a tough year for me mm-hmm. i had little breaks in between that year but it was a tough year for me i had good friends who came through for me but where yeah but as the year ends um I, at the beginning I, uh, as the year is ending I, i get a good job i get a good job at an advertising agency mm-hmm. uh one i'd always wanted to work for mm-hmm. i was working for the events business mm-hmm. um had great accounts um and then in the same year um I was given the opportunity to manage a night club as well uh that one I can mention Galileo and it was an amazing amazing experience you mm-hmm. know both the people I worked for was great having their mentorship and their trust and you know their direction but also just creating waves in Nairobi you yeah. know uh it was the best club and in the city at the time um we partnered with so many people we did you know fantastic events life was good i was the guy who could get you in to galileo's way <laughs> let me tell you power yes. i was powerful <laughs> powerful me and uh, the speaker of the national assembly we were same same <laughs> as in third in line to president <laughs> it was it was amazing um uh-huh. so it was a great year um and i was doing this both both these jobs at the same time so i was really pushing myself mm-hmm. um that year at the job i was working for at the agency we had we did a fast tasker project for him mm-hmm. that year um coke was doing one of their big campaigns which was a coke side of life mm-hmm. um so in some levels at different levels i was involved with this with this with this I mean for a young guy this is like you're, you're doing your dream job you know yes. and your creativity and all your ideas are welcome and are um I was working with a good team I had as with Fakili Wali and with uh, Monali Shan yes um I, I mean and on the other side try, trying my hand at copy copywriting mm-hmm. and you know someone like Arnold La- La- Latika Lakita. Lakita would have me would ha- would would just give me room to try mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. so such good times okay but as that year was ending i was so tired mm-hmm. <laughs> i was so tired i, I was working imagine. day and night i was so tired yeah. one day i looked at myself in the mirror and i couldn't recognize myself mm-hmm. and i quit both jobs wow mm just like cold mm. okay then what did you do for a living come january actually just, what what happened i was just chilling like a villain anyway so i i, I figured <laughs> I, i needed a break i needed to to take care of myself and maybe this is something now that i think about it I think over time i've always had a like a sense of where my boundaries are mm-hmm. you know like needing to take care of myself and so that you know I, i i left both jobs at well, same around the same time and then as um as 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 i was chilling as i was trying to figure out my next step mm-hmm. i realized i'm going to have a child on the way wow that i hadn't uh, sort of planned for yeah okay mm. all right so she comes to you she tells you she's pregnant and let me tell you you know i i think there needs to be a a manual uh-huh that guys can refer to when they hear the news right whether they are ready for it or whether they are prepared for it whether they've been looking for it. like we need to have a manual on what is appropriate response uh, for mm-hmm. me i was scared i was not ready for it mm-hmm. um but i have to say this that first my my children best thing that has ever happened to me and mm-hmm. i'm so grateful that they're in my life they've yeah. saved my life more than once mm-hmm. but that was a life altering moment for me yeah i was not working now i i was i was going to figure myself out but now i had the responsibility of you know parenting coming mm-hmm. um and thankfully with someone that has been an amazing co-parent to my children. 
um but scary <laughs> i know but so what scary. did you do you decided to do the right thing well the right thing was first to figure out work okay <laughs> so so yes the next year i got into a partnership with a friend of mine um who is an amazing filmmaker and at the time he was running an events to communication agency and we were trying to figure that out but then i think that's a yeah he he understood he wanted to make to make films and i foolishly couldn't see where film was going to be right um and i had this pressure of atoi mm-hmm. coming and i needed money now in fact yesterday mm-hmm. so so i i left that partnership and i decided to start my own communication agency we called it 360 degrees because i wanted to be able to offer 360 communication yeah. services above the line below the line uh now they through the line uh uh-huh. digital was just starting to you know it was in its very early days yeah um so there's that and then i needed to make a decision about this this parenting thing this family thing and yeah from from my upbringing from how i've always been uh the family that i come from my very christian background at uh, 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 at that time uh, well uh, as i said at that time it's not that i have abandoned it it's just that my i've been growing and i think my understanding of it different right i felt like i had no choice but to do the right thing mm-hmm. and i did marry uh, the mother of my baby okay um and listen i don't regret that decision yeah. It was an amazing decision she's an amazing human being um but i wasn't ready mm-hmm. for sure i okay. wasn't ready for that for that commitment um when i look back you know there could have been a slower way of dealing with it or i may have ended up with the same decision process um, yeah. but at the time I, you know i was backed up to a corner that's how i felt uh, mm-hmm. and when i look back i feel like I didn't have many choices. So right. I made that decision. I don't regret it. it was good good for me, good for the children. And then you go into 2008, you have this new business, you have this new baby, you have this new family. Everything is new. Even even you have a sense of newness. Uh-huh. <laughs> um and then there's a new election that has happened. Yes. <laughs> and no business. because 2008 was in the was beginning burning. yes yes the country was on fire mm-hmm. it was it was on fire uh from end, from the end of 2007 uh, for four months in 2008 we couldn't do anything mm-hmm. and for a guy who's just had a new family that's very scary yeah um and so because this is a failure effect let's just say by this time i've already experienced several failures uh-huh. i've failed at a previous relationship i've been fired I've failed i've um, well tried a partnership it hasn't worked mm-hmm. and i've started a business which is in a country that is burning yeah i'm familiar with failure we mm-hmm. are intimate we know each other right yeah we are friends mm-hmm. in fact hi felia how are you yeah <laughs> welcome to the table uh-huh um at the time i'd started going back to church i hadn't been in church for a while i'd found a church in south sea that mm-hmm. i liked mm-hmm. uh, called mavuno mm-hmm. uh i liked it because uh, they sort of they're like me in fact the first time i went to mavuno when i when i looked at guys in the service okay <laughs> It's okay. It's a truth. Felt familiar? Not just felt familiar. <laughs> Some of them were in the club at Galileo's with me <laughs> last night. I knew them. I knew them. Knew them by name. I knew what they drank. Like William say wa. And it felt great to have a non-judgmental space. Yes. Where I was accepted. Mm-hmm. Yet very honest and deep and I, I guess at that point may, maybe also I'm thinking as I as I speak maybe that's the point where authenticity started being attractive to me because right there's um I, i didn't need to show up as holy mm-hmm. at mavuno i just needed to show up as i am mm-hmm. and 
they used to have this phrase where they'd say that um, and it was a church for real people with real issues. Um, serving a real God, I think something like that. I forget. I'm so ashamed. I I, I marketed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but yeah, and and one of the things we used to say even at the time was like, you know, come as you are because you know God loves you just as you are. Yeah. But He just loves you too much, too mm -hmm. much to leave you as you are. Yeah. Um. And so. Anyway, I went I, at this time. I'm back to church. My family and I are going to church. I started serving uh, using those I'm seeing skills to host right. service in church. Also, like like a pastor. No, no, that... no, no, not yet. Hold okay, on, hold okay. On. Don't jump the gun. Oh, sorry. Okay? Relax. <laughs> Take this slow. This is a slow cook where you are. Okay. okay? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> no, it was just I, I, at this time I was just having opportunity to just get involved in mm -hmm. in, in church. So just like there, a guy would usher on Sunday. Uh, my skill is in my mouth, so I I, I decided serving, and yeah. you know my my friend Kanji. Who was working for the church at the time, Kanji Bogua, Bogua yeah, yeah, was uh, he, when he saw me in church, he was like, "Come here," you know, and uh -huh. started giving me some responsibility. And so this time in 2008, um, I'm already in the, you know, from, it's comfortable in that space. Uh, the church is moving from South Sea Sports Club, where they were live, the, we were meeting, uh, to Bellevue, which is where most people then get got to finally meet Mavono. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were working around a communication campaign, or the church was working around a communication campaign, both to the congregants, but also to the neighborhood to say that we are coming. We're, we're going to be at now Bellevue. Welcome, guys. And since I was doing nothing, and this was something I had skills for, then, you know, when I was asked, would you like to come and help mm -hmm. with this communication? I was like, yeah. yeah. So through my, through myself inside there, we moved. Uh, the church moved, and as it moved, then I thought, you know, this is not too bad. Maybe I could do some work for the church. And then uh, the senior pastor comes and, you know, sells vision, and I find myself as a pastoral trainee. Me. From the club. From club manager. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> okay, sorry. Yeah, no, it's okay. I'm also thinking. I'm trying to find a way to build the contrast. Well, <laughs> from shake your bum to lift your hands, yes. you know, it's, it's, it was quite something. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I did that for a year, worked okay. for the church and again, amazing experience. Mm -hmm. um, we were moving, we were changing how churches engaged with their congregation. Also, how churches engaged with community. Yeah, we were doing interviews at Capital FM uh, at, during task hour. You mm -hmm. know, uh, we were, you know, on the jam. You know, talking about church when the next ad is a booze ad, and that's when that's where we wanted to be. Right. Because because we were looking for guys like me. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, people who didn't feel comfortable. Yeah. Or felt judged. Um, and I was like, I know how to talk to these guys. These are the spaces we talk to these guys in. I got to do that. I got to help with the services. I got to help with the youth church. And I did that for a year and I loved it. And I grew and I learned so much. I mean, it was like school as well. Mm -hmm. But a year in, I knew I'm not a pastor for the church. Uh -huh. okay. For sure. Uh -huh. That's not me. Okay. You will not find me. <laughs> anyway, that's not my wuno anyway. So... Um, <laughs> So I left and I went back to the corporate world. Mm -hmm. That I didn't feel like I failed. That I felt like it was a season that I needed to, yeah. to, to, to grow in. You know, mm -hmm. I had someone running the business for me. Uh, we were sharing profit. He also needed to use uh, someone in the event space and great friend of mine. Mm -hmm. I go back into the corporate world and I go into this amazing business with a highly toxic environment. Um, As an employee, not not one that you'd started. No, 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 no. I, the, I'm working for someone. Yeah. In a cop, in, in a you know, it's well, not corporate, corporate, but big enough business to be called mm -hmm. corporate in terms of uh, turnover. But 
the environment was rough, mm-hmm. rough. And six months in, I couldn't, I couldn't last. Depending on who you ask that story, I either quit or I was fired. Okay. <laughs> I'm happy with either. I just <laughs> needed to leave. Yeah. And then now I go back to this small dream I had called 360. This car business that I had started in 2007. I didn't know whether it would, it would work or not. We had done a couple of events. Mm-hmm. We had become more of an events company. And I go back and I tell this guy, okay, this is the vision, blah, blah, blah. He wanted to do something different. So we part ways. And I take back this baby and I've, I start working on it. Mm-hmm. Literally, that story of young guy with no university degree, working from home in the garage, building a dream, that was me. Wow. And we worked hard. I had friends, Kanji, a friend of mine called Gerald, who was running another business, uh, the grass company, Brilliant uh, Insights Business. Uh, Kanji was running Kijiji agency, production then became agency, and together we would do work, together we would do, mm-hmm. we would dream. We were sitting in the same place when I finally got an office. And I worked hard. Wow. <laughs> hard. Uh-huh. And it's amazing. It was also an, a time in this country where, because we were in the Kimbaki government, mm-hmm. it was a time in this country where we could see the fruits of your labor. Yes. And you know, a year in into this slogging, just trying to literally knock on doors. Hey, my name is Amani. I run a, I, I can do communication for you. Do you need it? You know, we are with Canada, we are with Ogilvy, we are with who? Just mm-hmm. knocking on doors. One day, an opportunity presented itself. I wish I could say names, I can't, but mm-hmm. we then got to work for an, an, a financial services company. And we had the opportunity to do amazing work for them. Insights from grass. Um, we had some production work for ads. Mm-hmm. We had creative work that my team put together. We got them into the digital space. We started creating content for them. Wow. And while you are in that year, mm-hmm. I saw what a million looks like. Wow. Mm-hmm. Well, just one. But, <laughs> but, still it a was, but it was a million. <laughs> yeah. You know, I saw it. And that was an amazing feeling. Mm-hmm. An amazing feeling. On my 30th birthday, I, I, I remember remembering mm-hmm. <laughs> a statement I'd made when I was 23 that had come true mm-hmm. on my 30th birthday. Wow. I'd said that by 30, I'd be a millionaire living in my own house, uh-huh. driving a German car. Okay. And for all intents and purposes, uh-huh. even though it was not clear cut, the, those things had happened. Yeah. I had seen a million. Uh-huh. I was driving a German car. My family, were, you know, and I were driving a German car. Uh-huh. Small one. Okay. It's German. Yes. You know, even if it's a VW Polo. It's, it's still It's German. a German car. Yes. When I was saying this, at that time, there was no... <laughs> There was no way I was going to have a German car. At 23, when I was looking at, yeah. it was such a big dream. Mm-hmm. And we were already paying a mortgage for a house. So for all intents wow. and purposes, I was living in my own home, driving a German car, and I'd seen a million. And it's, I don't know if I can ever put to words the feeling that you get when you achieve your dream, when you realize, when it hits you, my goodness. I once wished for this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I, I, and I think everyone needs to take just a moment to recognize that often, even when we have a lot to complain, we have something we once prayed for. True. We have something we once wished for. Mm-hmm. You know? There was a time I used to drive around these neighborhoods coming from Doni, and Doni is not bad. Mm-hmm. It's just that this is nicer. Okay. okay. And I used to drive through this neighborhood sometimes in a borrowed moti, uh-huh. hoping that one day I will live as a teenager, as a, as, a, as a young adult, hoping one day I'll live in this neighborhood. Mm-hmm. I got to live in this neighborhood. Riverside. Riverside. You know, this upper... Where, yes, where yes, there are more yes, trees, where the mini trees. Where there are more trees, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so that was an amazing, amazing feeling at 30. Hey... But no sooner had than. Yeah. 
No, Suna had. So I, I, I had a couple of good, uh, good years. I got into a mentorship with one of the, you know, I'd say most brilliant Kenyan minds, mm -hmm. uh, older business, business mogul. I got involved in a political campaign. I got to see how that side of the of life looks like. The business mogul, <clears throat> sorry, was running for something. He was running for for a political office, mm -hmm. but also it was at the time, you know, it was flat. Eh? The, yeah. This the period between Kibaki and Uhuru transition. Mm -hmm. It was pretty flat. Like mm -hmm. literally, you could you could do this and reach power. You yeah. know, you could you you could. It was accessible. Yeah. And I, it might not be true for many people, but for some reason, you felt like if you really tried, you could talk to Hunye. Mm -hmm. If you really tried, you could you could reach the current president route. Or, yeah. Or, you know. So it was. So anyway, we got I got involved in a political campaign. So I had a really good season of just experimenting, trying, mm -hmm. making contribution. Because and I think every man needs to feel like they contribute to something. There, there is meaning, and those were amazing years. Um, Lots of life. I remember, I can remember the energy that I had, the energy that I carried, mm -hmm. the gratitude. Yeah. Feeling invincible. <laughs> right. Sounds like <clears throat> problems are about to start. Oh, some problems had already started. Okay. So I had made some choices in my marriage that had caught up with me. Mm -hmm. Talked about them elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But let's just say... I was not in a good place okay. in my marriage. I'd, I'd, and, and those are my choices that, you know, hurt other people. Mm -hmm. And as we tried to fix that, you know, I, as long as I believed there was, this, this, this could work for some reason. It was not threatened entirely. I guess I was okay. Okay. But then that political wave died down, that whole like madness of just life had sort of, and we'd got into a quiet space. And then um, my wife then and I, we realized that this is not working and um, I leave, okay. I leave the marriage. And that started a down, downward spiral mm -hmm. for me. I did not realize it then and I wish I did, but I got, I got into depression. I got sick. I got high blood pressure. Um, I was sleeping into depression slowly. I didn't know. But at some point, uh, two years into that separation, I was diagnosed with severe depression. I couldn't work. That great business that at this point was employing 12 people who are building careers around my vision and my dream, I couldn't see how it's going to keep that vision and dream going. So I shut my business down. And while you're from this guy who was, who could do this and reach power, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was staying at home, curtains closed, in darkness, no business, no income, no title or entitlement. <laughs> um, in depression, wasting away, feeling like I had completely failed. The failure of my marriage and now, you know, shutting down the business, I felt like everything had been taken away from me. My titles, you know, uh, husband. I kept my title father, but I didn't believe I was being a good father because I was not living with my children. Um, businessman, there was no business to be a businessman about, you know. Um, you know, even now the cars, the, the 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 German car, I'd left it. I had another one. I sold it because I needed the money. I had no income. Um, just all these things that I had used as identifiers. Even just the fact that you can walk into a room and people recognize you. You know, and I was doing well. I used to have, I used to have sometimes a driver. Wow. You know, one guy in my team would drive me, drop me at the door. You know, wherever you're going, you're dropped at the door. 
when you come back the car meets you at the you know akis <laughs> let i'm so sorry <laughs> but so this i used this as scratches and identifiers and i didn't mm. have them anymore and i hit i hit rock bottom uh-huh. and then i discovered rock bottom had a basement wow like, as the, you can actually go lower uh, i went so low oh, i'm so sorry so low um my therapist at the time actually put me on suicide watch oh i don't, I, did, i wasn't suicidal i don't think i was suicidal mm-hmm. but once in a while the thought crossed my mind for if i left what would happen but then i wouldn't follow it through yeah but now i had my boys checking in on me i had my boys calling me and sometimes it was a therapist was like ebu go check on your boy mm-hmm. you know just to make sure i'm okay yeah i'm alive at least mm-hmm. and when i told you earlier that my children saved my life this was a period my children saved my life because right. i one of the things i had to live for was them mm-hmm. when you feel like you've lost everything else they living for my children that that gave me purpose so like how how often would you see them so at that time i used to see them every other week every other week so every fortnight mm-hmm. so so i'd have two weeks that were bad yeah you shower sporadically like yeah. once every three days yeah you don't move from the house at smoke like a chimney mm-hmm. any no curtains drawn don't leave nothing i don't even know how i survived yeah. that time and then there'd be the friday they are coming over for the weekend from thursday the energy starts checking in yeah you know maybe thursday i'll make the bed uh-huh my my cleaning lady would come and at least the house was clean not mm-hmm. filthy but on friday curtains are open You know that's one of the days a cleaning lady would come. Yeah. I'd go shopping, find mm-hmm. food, mm-hmm. stock the fridge, just you know put in by the time the kids come and we are flipping burgers in the house. Oh, it's wow. just it's amazing. Yeah. They're having a great experience of their dad. Yeah. And even I am having a shot, mm-hmm. you know, like a shot of life, eh? Yes. In my system. Yes. And Friday, Saturday activity, fun, movie. go out walk karura something whatever yeah. sunday church sunday afternoon their mother would come for them and as soon as they leave the gate back down kwanza now triggered by separation anxiety ah they rem- you remembering that you're a failure you're the kind of father whose children live to go live with their mother you know yeah i had a horrible time and i think two years that i'd never wish on my worst enemy mm-hmm. even though to be honest i've had good support mm-hmm. and I, i i am so grateful from friends who stood by me yeah there were days i was lonely alone scared <laughs> I remember one day Yeah, that's that's a that's a strong confession it is, for a it's man. It's true, it's true. Know. I remember one day <laughs> um a Christmas. So let me tell you, eh? Christmas reminds you you are alone. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think my second Christmas after the separation I I sent a text to a group of men that uh, I I was I was I'm still in mm-hmm. called Muscles and the late from uh big kev mm-hmm. he read into my text and he called me and we had like a la- an hour long conversation where the guy was just trying to calm me down oh i was crying hysterically wow uh just feeling alone alone and you've messed up yeah you've messed up big time Mm-hmm. and this is a, as a result of my i'm not a victim this is a result of my choices mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. um i know very many men that are going through tough times with their families and the, there's something even even the worst of us when a marriage fails it yeah. breaks us yeah 
there is something about those, either the vows that you say, the hopes and dreams, how society looks at us when we are, when we have our stuff together. And then when that is taken away mm-hmm. or ripped apart, whether out of your choices of, or those of other people, it, it's one of the things I've watched over and over again that could single-handedly break down a man. Right. I mean, men lose jobs and recover. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but there's something about marriages that... Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's a bit difficult to bounce back from. And then now if you're going through that and then you have no jobo and then you have, you know... Yeah. So I think that that was my lowest point. Uh-huh. But then 2018 came. Mm-hmm. So 2018... Let me let me set it up. So 2017, I'm not really working, but once in a while I'll do, I'll do a random, a random gig here and there, whether it's like a team building gig or an MC gig, because I recognize that I need money. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, here mentally I recognize that I need money. So when the opportunity comes, you'll master all the strength. Yeah. Um, and l- listen, guys, when someone is in depression, someone is struggling with a mental illness. You may think they're just being lazy. They need to snap out of it. It's a disease. You can't snap out of a cold. <laughs> yes. You know, you can't snap out of a flu or snap out of diarrhea. It's the same thing. You can't snap out of a mental illness. So anyway, I'm, at, I'm doing this team building gig in Mombasa, and I meet this guy who is one of my clients, one of the people in the team building. An older man, a uh, foreigner, who we just get to talk, and the guy tells me about him being on his third marriage. Third marriage. And the guy loves God. The guy looks like he's having the he's he's living his best life. I'm like, oh, it's possible. Mm-hmm. It's possible to get over this, to get past yeah. this place I'm in and try again and try again. Mm-hmm. And this guy gives me courage for me to fight for myself. Mm -hmm. And I entered 2018 as the year that for me was the fight for myself year. Despite everything I was feeling, I also did not want to be a cautionary tale. Mm -hmm. I did not want to be the story that look at this guy and how he used to be. Yeah. Now look at him. Mm -hmm. So I fought for myself. Mm -hmm. I fought for myself. I did... The, you know, I went back to therapy. I got into some programs. Okay. I did three programs that year. Mm-hmm. Um, each, all of them faith-based programs, mm-hmm. but one that particularly was, and each served a different purpose. The first one, for me, gave me a sense of mission. Mm-hmm. That, you know, it reminded me that God was not done with me yet. Mm-hmm. The second one, Reminded me that I, had, I was feeling like my life is over. Over. I was 35, man. <laughs> uh, How is my life over at 35? <laughs> you know, indeed, but yeah. I, I feel like my life was... Mm-hmm. But I was going into my late 30s and had so much time ahead of me. But being in this fishbowl, yeah. you feel like you have, you have already messed your entire life up. Mm-hmm. That's what the second program did for me. Just somehow it gave me a sense of perspective that I had time. But the third one that I did that year, uh, it's called Crucible. It got me to face myself. Wow. And for the first time, I got to see who I really am. Mm -hmm. The good, the bad, the ugly. Okay. Because that's difficult. I mean, that's the thing that human beings spend all of their lives avoiding facing themselves, you know? And you know, you're t- I don't know about you, but in the world I've been brought up in, because me, I've been brought up in church, mm-hmm. is the bad and the ugly, what you do is you nail it to the cross. Yes. You, you, you throw it somewhere <laughs> in a fire, bonfire. You, cover you know, it in you, the blood you write of Jesus. it. Yeah, you cover it in the blood of Jesus. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you. you I think there's a certain sense of denial yeah. that is couched in Christianity, in, in faith and in religion, 
which is dangerous. Mm -hmm. For the first time, I was told, you see this good, bad, and ugly? This everything? Embrace it. Mm -hmm. Own it. Yeah. This is really you. Mm -hmm. And as you embrace it and as you own it and as you, like, literally love yourself. <laughs> yeah. All of you. All of you. Learn that God loves all of you as well. Yeah. And like I said, he wants you to shop as you are. Mm -hmm. He loves you as you are. Just doesn't want to leave you. He loves you too much to leave you as you are. Right. And for me, that was mind blowing. That, that, that experience was, I felt seen. Yeah. Not just by me, but this band of brothers that I was doing this with. I felt seen, I felt heard, felt accepted, despite right. me knowing the ugly side of me and them knowing as well. Mm -hmm. And so I first started to learn to own my choices and you know, go back to that authenticity story, now to present myself for who I really, truly am, everything that I am. Right. Without fear of people, whether they like me or not, or mm -hmm. you know. So that was one. But secondly, you know, there's a question I kept being asked during this process: was, what do you want, and what do you really want? What do you really want? And I kept saying freedom. Yeah. And I, I couldn't understand what this freedom meant. Mm -hmm. I knew I wanted to be free yeah. from something. There was something holding me down, but I couldn't tell what this what this freedom was that I needed. But I started to crack it, and I think the first place I cracked it at was I needed freedom of expression. Right. I needed to be able to speak my truth mm -hmm. and be allowed to speak my truth. Now, I'm very aware that as a dude, I am part of the patriarchy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm very aware that... Um, we, we seem to have everything working for us and we can say what we want to say without consequence. Yes. But that's not true. Aha. Uh -huh. Explain. Men actually have very few things that they can say correctly. Okay. In fact, in this woke world, <laughs> it's even worse. Uh -huh. But I think for me the tragedy is we don't have or we often don't have safety to speak about our emotions authentically. Right. For example, if you, if you, if you and I were in a relationship, which would be great, you know? <laughs> if, uh -huh. for example, you are, you know, in love with me, which would be amazing. So, you know. <laughs> okay. And then today we had a disagreement. Uh-huh. And you decided to raise your voice. Uh -huh. And, you know, you express yourself in this disagreement. Yeah. To an outsider looking in, you're probably just expressing yourself. Yeah. You're getting your, you're saying, you're having your mind hard. Uh -huh. If I did the very same thing and raised my voice to express displeasure, uh -huh. to an outsider looking in, it's very easy for that to be labeled as abuse. Right. Yeah. And so for most men, an expression of anger is abuse. Right. It's an interesting perspective. I hadn't, I had never envisioned it like that because you do, as a human being, you do have a right to your anger and to express I it. I feel I all this, all the emotions you feel. Yeah. I feel angry. I feel scared. Mm -hmm. I feel sad. I feel disappointed. Yeah. But especially for those that are called negative emotions, not bad, negative, mm -hmm. and I'll distinguish. We have very limited scope yeah. on how we can express those emotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've had women say, and it's the truth of what I've had them mm -hmm. say, that if you came home and you found your man you know, cowered on the corner <laughs> in fear. How does that make you feel? Uh, like my world has caved in, like the, the, your source of safety is gone. So 
the guy, regardless of how afraid he is, will never have the opportunity to express that fear. Right. Because he has to be strong for you and uh -huh. his family. Okay. So what happens to that energy? You, you do realize that emotions are energy. You cannot destroy them. Yeah. So anger, unresolved anger, unexpressed anger. It just bunches up inside. Bunches up. Yeah. Fear, unexpressed, unresolved. Mm -hmm. Sadness, un unexpressed, embarrassment, whatever. All those things, they're just being, where do you think that energy goes? Right. Where does it go? Well, it could be at the ex one extreme, it could end in suicide. Okay. And we have statistics now that yeah. are talking about how many men are mm -hmm. resulting to suicide. Um, the strange thing is that more women attempt suicide than men, mm -hmm. but men find more violent and efficient means. Wow. Of suicide, so. Wow. Okay. Some of that is 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 dissipated sexually. Mm -hmm. So, if part of the source of pain is a woman, mm -hmm. <laughs> this man will conquer as many women sexually. Right. To express. Yes. <laughs> this. Sorry, I keep hitting this microphone. We have so <laughs> many bumps <laughs> in the sound. Sorry. No worries. Uh, uh -huh. You know. Some of it is violence, yeah. you know? And I suppose substance abuse and as well. Substance abuse. Oh, oh, I forgot about that. Yeah. The, uh, I think the alcohol epidemic that we have yeah. in the country is just a lot of suppressed emotions. Mm -hmm. I can get into a whole <laughs> debate about that. Um, but for me, I needed to express myself. Uh -huh. There's a lot of things I felt I didn't have permission to express. Okay. Um, a lot of these emotions that I couldn't really say. I didn't feel like I could say. I couldn't say that I, I couldn't own the failure. I couldn't own the mistakes that I'd made. I couldn't. Anyway, that need for expression gave birth to the podcast Living Truthfully. Right. The award winning podcast. The award winning podcast. Yes. Thank you for remembering. <laughs> I, I make fun of that award because it, it meant so much for me, yet it was such an unexpected. Uh, we got the big award for Best Podcast in Kenya 2019. Congratulations. I wasn't trying to find, I wasn't trying to win an award. Yeah. I didn't even know when I was nominated. Yeah. I, someone said, I voted for you, sent me a text, I voted for you. Like, voting for what? And that's when I found out about the nomination. All I was trying to do was express myself. Mm -hmm. And as I started to express myself, I started to create a space for other people to express, other men mm -hmm. to express themselves as well. With this self-expression came people saying, come and speak to us. Mm -hmm. You seem to have found something. Come and speak to us. And I started speaking. What I didn't tell you is in that year, I was fighting for myself just to keep my mind engaged. I started thinking about how I'd go back to the, to the workspace and the corporate space. And a friend of mine and I developed this corporate culture product called Pit Stop, mm -hmm. which was fashioned against the, uh, uh, around the Formula One uh, Pit Stop, where cars stopped to have their tires changed. Right. Um, and we, we found three pillars, you know, trust, innovation, and performance that we built a product around. Mm -hmm. In 2018, in my, as I'm fighting for myself, I developed a product that I'm selling today. Okay. You know, I think for me, the conversation I want to have, or I'm hoping that people can take out of this is, so there's an interesting story. There's failure as a result of my choices. And, you know, I, I did, I, I did hurt people. Mm -hmm. But that process got me to really, truly find and accept my true self. Right. And no failure is wasted. Mm -hmm. I've found that people who, dig and lean into that space that they are in. They accept that, excuse my friend, this is the shit I'm in. Uh -huh. And out of this, I'm going to work through. I'm not going to avoid it. I'm not going to, um, I'm not, 
close deny, your eyes. Yeah. Uh, you know, close my eyes. I'm not going to hide away from it. I'm going to work through it. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen one person who's done that and not come out on the other side a much more fulfilled human, right. a changed person. Mm -hmm. Today, I don't care for accolades. I don't care for, I don't care for that, for title. I, yeah. you know, I, or recognition. Or recognition. Big, yeah. big car, walk into the room, people stand up. I don't care for that thing. At some point, I thought that's the path I wanted. Today, I want, I want people to feel that with me, they're accepted. Right. With me, they're safe. With mm -hmm. me, there's no, there's no judgment. Yeah. It's a reason I, I went to now coaching, solo work coaching and mediation. I want to help people find common ground speak, find peace. Mm -hmm. I want people to go to work and have a great working environment. That's why I'm doing this culture work. Yeah. I want you to be able to show up as you are wherever. Those are the things that people are rushing for. Not necessary. I don't desire for them. Okay. I mean, do I want to live well and comfortably? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, do I want to make sure my children get the best education? Yes. Do I necessarily want to have all the money in the world? No. no. Okay. I found enough. And I found that there is, there can be enough. Yeah. Do I want to have the biggest house in the neighborhood? In fact, not. I want a small house on the beach, <laughs> you know? Which is pretty much what you're doing right now. Yeah? Close to it. Close <laughs> to it. Because you moved you moved. I moved to Diani. And, and it's yeah. part of that authenticity. It's realizing that I couldn't afford the lifestyle I was living in Nairobi. Yeah. I needed to cut down my expenses mm -hmm. by over 50%. Um, so the question became, where can I live for less than half what I was paying rent in Nairobi, but still get a good quality life? And as I was looking at the outskirts, Thika, Kitengela, you know, Kiseria, Nisenya, I asked myself, if I can live that far, why can't I then live anywhere else I'd mm -hmm. like to live? And I started considering Nanyuki, you know, Diani. And that idea became very attractive. And actually, on some things, I make decisions very fast. So when the thought Diani came to mind, 10 days later, I was living in Diani. Wow. Yeah. That's some quick action. Yep. Okay. All right. So it's um, the things that are important to me have changed. Mm -hmm. Relationships, connection, that's, that's more important to me. Uh, I want to add value to people's lives. I want to add value to my clients' lives. Um, whether it's a coaching client, a mediation client, or a culture client, an MC client. I do want to, and I want to be paid for my value. Yes. Yeah. For, for what it's really worth. Yes. But not because I want the biggest car in the block. Right. Yeah. No, not anymore. Because you're looking for fulfillment within yourself, I suppose. I think, I think I have found that if you live your life for more than yourself, you will have fulfillment. You will not have to look for it. Yeah. Um, I found that there is joy in contentment. And contentment is not lack of ambition. Contentment is just knowing there is, there is an enough. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be the richest, the right. biggest, the, you know. If you're going to be in a room and you want to be the most of anything, be the most interested. Yes, yes. Yes, indeed. Be the most curious. Yeah. Be the most open, mm -hmm. you know. There, there are places where people are not racing to be that you can have a niche. Yeah. Um, and it's better to be the, to, in a room, it's better to be interested, more, more interested than interesting. Mm -hmm. I'd rather today, okay, yes, I speak for a living, but in any other room, I'd rather keep quiet and listen. Yeah. And learn. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. So, yeah. Okay. So, I'm curious, if we're looking for a culture whisperer, where do we find you? If you're looking for a culture whisperer, <laughs> just whisper. There's a Batman signal you send in there. Um, so, chief at amanimaranga.com. Mm hmm I'm Amani Maranga on all social media. Okay. So you can DM me on each, either, either of them. Mm -hmm. I work with a wonderful team of associates that, um, you know, uh, I'm happy to 
rope along, uh, along into any organization, some of the brightest Kenyans mm -hmm. in f the people field. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, or you can come to Diani. Please come to Diani. Ah, uh, bus, bus. Ladies and gentlemen, your open invitation to go to Diani is here. <laughs> Thank you so much for that story. It's been wonderful listening to it. And I hope that all you gentlemen out there who've listened to Amani and understood his journey and how he learn to be his authentic self and live his life truthfully. I hope, I sincerely hope this will inspire you. I assume you are open for conversations from gentlemen who would love to advance this line of thought. With Both you. ladies and gentlemen. Niko Kwa Soko. Ah, yeah. Soko. <laughs> yeah, Niko Kwa Soko. So, Niko Naswali, why do you do the failure effect? Why do I do the failure effect? Yeah. Because I think that um, people don't talk enough about the downs that they went through and how they survived them. We only ever talk about the success, right? And it's, I suppose it's a form of validation, but then it's not authentic. It's not your authentic mm -hmm. story. And it doesn't really inspire anyone as much as you being open and honest and saying, I suffered, I failed, but this is how I survived. This is how I learned to cope. Then people connect with you a lot better. So really, this is just to inspire people. Okay. Right. Good stuff. <laughs> okay, right. So that was my turn answering a question, which is very rare for me. Um, otherwise, I hope you have enjoyed this interview and let's see you next week for another one like this one.